Okay, so welcome to the culture seminar, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Joel Donner, uh, who will talk about rigorous computations of eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. Please, Joel. Yes, thank you. Okay, yes, uh, thank you very much, and thank you for, for the invitation to, to come here and talk. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very nice, and I hope you will. I think what I will talk about is maybe a bit outside of at least most of the topics I've seen at this seminar, uh, uh, but hopefully. Uh, it will be uh, interesting nevertheless. Uh, so we'll talk about some work I've done in, I guess it's mainly two papers. Uh, one is with Bruno Salvi, who's at the ONS in Lyon, uh, which I did a few years ago now. And another paper, which is uh, together with my one of my current supervisors, Javier gomez Serrano, who's at Brown University, and also Kimberly Howe, who was one of his uh, undergrad students who uh, did a bit of the, of the work. Uh, I should also mention that uh, Javier uh, was supported by the ERC grant you see here during during this work. Uh, yes, so let's get started. So to begin, me just let uh, just let me give the sort of basic setting. Uh, so in this talk, I'll be interested in eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of the Dirichlet rotation. So in this sort of general setting, we work with some bounded domain uh, omega. And then the equations we're interested in is the uh, eigenfunction equation for the uh, Laplacian. So minus Laplace of uk is equal to lambda k uk. And this should be satisfied inside of omega. And we work with Dirichlet boundary conditions, meaning that uh, the eigenfunction should be equal to zero on the boundary of omega. And it's sort of well known that in this setting, the eigenvalues are all positive uh, and uh, they tend to infinity. Uh, and so that you can order them like this. And it's also known that the, the first eigenvalue is, is always uh, simple. So you can have double eigenvalues in principle, and we will see some of them in fact, but the first one is always simple. Excuse me. Um, why do you need a negative sign on the Laplacian? Um, uh, it's just a normalization factor. Uh, so I, I think uh, this is the, it's to make it, uh, let me see. I mean, so normally when you work with the Laplacian, you work with lambda uk is equal to zero, and then the minus doesn't matter. Uh, so this minus is, in some cases, you write it lambda uk uh, plus lambda k uk. And this is just to make the normalization correct with, with respect to how you usually see it like that. Uh, okay. So it's just to make it sort of, uh, otherwise you have, we have to flip the sides here. So it's nice to have them positive. Uh, I mean, the method is, side... is, there, is there any uh, physical significance of that minus sign? I mean, so, uh, so that all the lambdas are positive, I mean, or yes, greater than so... zero even. So, so the negative sign must have some physical significance, right? Yes, I think that is the, the natural way to look at the Laplacian. Uh, so, I mean, normally you look at it, in, in a lot of cases, you look at it being zero, and then the minus sign doesn't really matter. Uh, but uh, oh, when I you look at eigenvalues, you, okay. you do want the minus sign to, to get this uh, this uh, to get this to be positive. Uh, so I guess maybe some people would prefer to define Laplace with a minus sign, but uh, but this is not uh, normal. Yeah. So normally you define it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I mean this, the methods I will discuss do sort of work in this general setting, at least to some extent. Uh, but I will focus on two different applications in this talk. One is related to, uh, in one, omega will be a spherical triangle. Uh, so we'll work uh, on the sphere. And in one, omega will be, well, not exactly this domain, but a planar domain. So we'll work on the plane. So the methods will work in both of these cases. It works in other cases as well. Uh, but these are the ones I will talk about today. What's uh, the coloring? Ah, the, the coloring here is yes, this is one example of an eigenfunction. Uh, this is the first eigenfunction for this uh, uh, triangle, and it happens to look like this. So it's uh, this is uh, sort of a plot of the eigenfunction and the value. And this is the second eigenfunction for this domain. Uh, and here it's negative and here it's positive. Uh, so it's just two examples of the, of the eigenfunctions. 
So before we get into the applications, uh, let me just sort of very briefly describe the actual method that we will use. Uh, so the first thing is we want to be able to compute approximate eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Uh, and the method we use for this is called the method of particular solutions, or MPS for short. Uh, it was introduced quite some time ago by Fox and Rich and Moller in already in 1967. Uh, but a, a quite important paper related to this was also a paper by Betsk and Trevelin in 2005 uh, called the Reviving the Method of Particular Solution, where they discuss some, uh, some important numerical color considerations to make this sort of well-behaved and actually get a good con con convergence in more cases. Uh, and what the method produces is an approximate eigenvalue eigenfunction pair. And with approximate, in this case, I mean that the approximate eigenfunction it satisfies the uh, differential equation exactly. So here there is no approximation. But uh, the boundary condition is not exactly satisfied. So here is where we have an approximation. So it should be approximate zero on the boundary in some sense. Uh, so the, the differential equation is exactly satisfied, but not the boundary conditions. Here is where the approximation comes in. How do you see this method? How do you, how does one um, store the function? How does one represent the function? Yes. So the idea is that you write this approximation as a linear combination of basis functions. Uh, and the important part with this basis function is that they should satisfy the differential equation, uh, but you have no conditions on the boundary, no, no boundary conditions at all for them. So if they satisfy the uh, differential equation, then so will their linear combination, since it's a linear differential equation. Uh, and the idea is to pick these coefficients and this linear combination so that the linear combination is approximately zero on the boundary. Uh, and so, so what you represent it as is these coefficients and then your choice of basic functions. And I will come back to this choice of basis functions later on because it's very important for the convergence. And somehow uh, what these papers do is give you one set of things you can work with, one set of basic functions that work well in many cases. Uh, and then there's been more papers later on, which have introduced more, uh, more basis functions that are also useful. Uh, so I will come back to this. Uh, so with the help of MPS, we can compute this approximate eigenvalues eigenfunctions. Uh, but, but as I said, we also want to have rigorous bounds in this case. We want to uh, be able to tell how far is this approximation from the, from the true thing. Uh, and from this, we have the following theorem. Uh, which is from Moller and Payne, uh, about the same time as they introduced the MPS method from the beginning. So given an approximate eigenpair, as I, as I, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, the key thing to measure here is this value mu. So mu is given by just, first there's some normalization, the area of the domain, you divide by the norm of the eigenfunctions. You can see this mostly as normalization factors. But the important part is, is the supremum on the boundary. So remember that uh, the approximate eigenfunction should be close to zero on the boundary. And the, the, sort of the, the more zero it is on the boundary, uh, the better of an approximation it is. Uh, and then mu will be small. And in particular, if we have an actual eigenfunction, well, then it's exactly zero on the boundary, and mu will be zero. Uh, so mu sort of measures how good of an approximation it is. And from this mu, we can actually get these bounds. So what the theorem says is that there exists an eigenpair, lambda k uk, so a true eigenpair, and it satisfies the following. First, it satisfies that the approximate eigenvalue minus the, uh, the, the exact eigenvalue is bounded by this mu in this way. So if mu is small, then lambda tilde and lambda k are close. So from this mu, we can get this precise bound for how far away is our approximate eigenvalue from the true eigenvalue. Uh, and this is uh, the first step. And the second step is that we want to get bounds on u, uh, on the approximate eigenfunction. Uh, and they give some different bounds. You can get L L2 bounds, but in our case, we are mostly interested in the L infinity bounds. Uh, so what they say is that u, two, uh, u tilde minus uk uh, the L infinity bound for this basically is given by this, uh, some a bit larger expression. And maybe the important thing here is the, well, it's the supremum on the boundary again, which already came up here. Then it's the mu comes up. 
And then we have two new things, which is g of x and alpha. Uh, g of x is this integral of the Green's function, so it depends on the domain and uh, on the, uh, the Laplace equation. It's not so important in practice, at least not in our work, because we can just bound it by a constant. I will I will come back to this later. Uh, what is more important than this alpha? Uh, so this alpha is the distance from our approximate eigenfunction, our eigenvalue, to the not the nearest eigenvalue, but the next nearest. So uh, lambda tilde will in general be close to some lambda k, but this talks about the distance to the next nearest after that. So to get this L infinity bound, we need to not only understand our eigenvalue that we're looking at, the, the one we're approximating, but we need to have information about the nearby ones as well. Uh, so this is important. And uh, this actually complicates things a bit, and I will come back to this later again. May I ask about this? Yes. So if I, if I had a double eigenvalue, as you mentioned, uh, yes. would, would this be like zero? Or, the, or sorry, would alpha be equal to mu? Uh, like this? No. So if you have a double eigenvalue, uh, then uh, so the, then you will count the next one nearest, not counting the double eigenvalue. Ah, okay. So it, it's still, he, for the purpose of this theorem, it's still kind of like like simple. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, but you. numerically, it's complicated because numerically, I mean, if you only have numerics, it's it's usually hard to prove that it is a double eigenvalue. Uh, so this does occur, and I will talk a bit about this. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, so now we have the method for computing the approximation, the MPS. We have so this so, theorem. Me. Hmm? So there's in, in a theorem, uh, you should say there exists a k, is that correct? Yes, yes. Uh, this holds for some k. OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, but we don't know which k, which is also important. And I will come back to this, this later on again. Ah, all right. Uh, so we have this method for computing the approximation, the MPS. We have this theorem for computing the, uh, which gives us information about the bounds. Uh, but we need to actually be able to compute these bounds as well. And to do this rigorously, we can just, I mean, you, you cannot just use the standard numerical methods with floating points and uh, floating points because you will run into rounding errors and discretization errors. Uh, so to handle this, we uh, make use of interval arithmetic. Uh, I will be and not talk so much about this because uh, I mean there's not enough time somehow. Uh, but uh, if you have not encountered integral arithmetic before, or in this case it's rather ball arithmetic, uh, it's a way to compute those things so that you can get uh, rigorous bounds on your on your results. So basically, in, if we have u two tilde and we want to evaluate it at some point, say one over ten zero, instead of evaluating at exactly this point, we evaluate it at some some small ball which encloses this value and well zero we can represent exactly so we evaluate it on this ball and with the help of this ball arithmetic we can get an enclosure which is again a ball so we don't know what this exactly what this value is but we know that this value for certain is enclosed in this interval and since what we will need is to compute upper bounds of things in general this is fine because then this interval, an upper bound for this interval gives us an upper bound of the value. Question. And Question. Um, what, uh, what exactly, so how, how does discretization work here? Uh, so in how using integral arithmetic you can avoid uh, the associated errors? Uh, so in this example here, there's no discretization error, uh, but for example, when we need to compute the maximum of the boundary, then there are discretization errors. But what you can do, I guess it's sort of shown in this picture. So here you have a function, which looks like this. And then you want to enclose this. And what you do is that you work with intervals all the time. So you divide this interval you want to bound it on into smaller intervals. And then you give this interval to your function. It gives you some enclosure. Uh, so in that way, you don't only evaluated on points on the uh, on the uh, on the, the x-axis, but on full intervals, and in that way you can actually compute enclosures. Uh, in the end, uh, from your experience, uh, well, the intervals keep growing, right? Um, do you still get a reasonable uh, interval at the end, or is it too big often? And so, can 
specify in advance uh, you know, the width so that you can change something from the beginning. So uh, usually, I mean, you have to do some work to get the enclosures to be good enough. Uh, and this is, I mean, it, it's a very important part of, of the process somehow. Uh, I will show this a bit later, but when we compute the bounds on the boundary, then we make use of Taylor expansions. So we use, make use of Taylor expansions and then rigorously bound the, the error term. And then we use Taylor expansions of order, say, 100 or so to be able to get uh, these tight enclosures. Uh, because indeed, it very easily happens that the enclosures you get are, are too wide and sort of don't tell you anything. Uh, but uh, with using this interval arithmetic uh, and these Taylor expansions together, you can most of the time get good enclosures. Uh, but this is an art in some sense. It's something you have to specify. You have to choose the way you do this depending on the on the precise application. Uh, if you want an introduction to this field, I would say that Warwick Tucker's book Validating Numerics is one of the sort of standard references for this. Uh, Yes. OK, let's get to the applications. So the first application, it's related to random walks. Uh, and the underlying goal, in some sense, is to understand the asymptotic behavior of discrete walks on, on n to the d. Uh, and in this case, we're interested in the, the number of walks of length n starting and ending at the origin. Uh, and then the steps you take in this random walk are given from some uh, from some uh, step set, which sort of determines the type of walk you have. And it's known that asymptotically this behaves like k times rho to the n times n to the alpha. k and rho are quite easily computable from, uh, from the step set, whereas this alpha is, uh, is more complicated. And this is sort of what we're interested in here. If you use, do some asymptotic analysis, you can relate this to Brownian motions. And then from Brown emotions, you can get to, to the Laplace equation. And you can show that this alpha is actually given, related in this way to the first eigenvalue of some spherical triangle, which depends on your precise walk. Uh, so from the walk, you get a spherical triangle, you get the first eigenvalue, and this gives you alpha. And an important question is whether this alpha is rational or not. Uh, so uh, because it has important implications for, for what this, uh, uh, the number of walks, how this can behave. Uh, and the, I should say, mask, hmm? a good question. So alpha, which is expressed by a formula and alpha on a picture, ah, so, they are the same uh, or different? So uh, I have three alphas in the talk, they're all different. So I have, okay. uh, this alpha is not the same as this alpha. Uh -huh. uh, they just have, happen to be the same on the triangle. Ah, okay. And I also have an alpha in the theorem, which is also different from this alpha. OK, OK, thank you. Uh, so that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, uh, but, so the important question here is whether alpha is rational or not is one important question. And in the work we did here, we can't answer this question for certain. Uh, but what we try to do is look at, does it look like alpha is rational or not? So you can compute high precision uh, approximations and then look at this and see, OK, does it look like maybe alpha is rational or not? Uh, so it's sort of more experimental in some sense. We don't prove a theorem in the end, but we give some sort of experimental evidence that maybe it looks like this is rational or not rational. Uh, and then the second application uh, is related to Payne's conjecture. Uh, and in this case, our work is not only experimental, but, but the re end result is a, is a theorem related to this. Uh, and Payne's conjecture, which uh, from 1967, it's asked, uh, it states that the nodal line of U2 on a bounded domain in R2 must touch the boundary. So we have a bounded domain in R2, this is fine. And then we have U2, so the second eigenfunction. And the nodal line is the zero set of the eigenfunction. Uh, so in this picture here, uh, we would have uh, that the nodal line is this white part here. So it would start at this point, go along this white part, and end at this point here. Uh, so in, the nodal line does indeed always form a line. Uh, and at least in this case, it does touch the boundary in two cases. And the conjecture is about, does this always happen or not? And this has also been extended to a higher dimensional case later on. Uh, 
this is still open. This conjecture is still open in the general case, uh, but there has been some some partial positive results. So it has been proved for convex domains, uh, and it has been proved for domains under various sort of symmetries or convexity assumptions. Uh, but uh, in 1987, there was a counterexample. Uh, so Hoffman Ostenhoff, Hoffman Ostenhoff, and Alice Rashvili uh, constructed a counterexample to this. And the, the important part with their counterexample is that it's not simply connected. So the conjecture is still open in the general case, but rather the conjecture is still open for simply connected domains. There we don't know if it holds or not. Uh, but if it's not simply connected, then we know that there are counterexamples, which they gave here. Uh, and the construction is as follows. So they considered sort of two circles, one inscribed in the other, and then they construct the domain by cutting holes in the inner circle. So the domain here would be this inner part and this outer part here. And then they cut more and more holes in this inner circle, so you get more and more holes here. And then they prove using a limiting argument that the nodal line in the end will be contained inside this inner circle and not touch the boundary. Uh, so this will be a counterexample to the uh, to the conjecture in that case. Uh, this has been extended to higher dimensions uh, as well. But uh, the important part is that their proof, their counterexample, does not give any lower uh, sort of explicit lower bound and number boundary components. So they just say that if you cut enough holes, then eventually the nodal line will be contained inside the inner uh, circle. But it doesn't say anything about how many holes you need to cut. Uh, and they mention in the, in the paper that it's sort of delicate to bound and of the order 10 to the 9. Uh, so a natural question then is, which was asked in the original paper, what is the smallest number and zero of boundary components for a counterexample? So we know that there's if it, there's enough holes, then we have a counterexample. Uh, but what's the smallest number of holes we need? Uh, and zero equal to one would mean that you have a simply connected domain. And in, as I mentioned, it's still open in this case, but at least it's believed to be true. So uh, what is the smallest number of answer? Can we go down to one or is it some other number? And here is where our contribution comes in. Uh, so uh, we prove the following theorem. So that there exists a planar domain, which has six holes, so seven boundary components, for which the nodal line of the second eigenfunction does not touch the boundary. Uh, the domain looks like this. So it's a hexagon with some holes cut out like here. Uh, and here you can see a plot of the eigenfunction. So on this outer part, it's uh, negative, And in this uh, middle part, it's, it's positive. And you, here, this white part, which you don't really see in the picture, uh, it's, it's zero. And from this plot, it's unclear. I mean, you don't see in this plot if this white part touches the boundary or not. Uh, what you can do is you can sort of tweak the, fig the colors a bit. So now the green part is where it's zero. And here it's a bit easier to, uh, you still can't really see it in this picture. I will show a better picture soon. But in fact, this does not touch the boundary. So the, uh, the nodal line is very close to the boundary, but it doesn't quite touch it, uh, which means that we get a counterexample to, to the conjecture. Uh, so before I continue, I should mention that this counterexample oh, is in no way unique. Oh, hmm? when, you, when you say it doesn't touch, is there an epsilon that uh, away uh, from the boundary or what? The, that's an explicit, uh, we get an explicit distance to the boundary. Uh, so uh, okay. we get that, okay, it is at least this distance away from the boundary right. uh, with some explicit number, uh, which, okay, I guess I will not show the number, but we get some explicit number. For this. Uh, and I should maybe mention that this counterexample is in no way unique. We have found a lot of other candidates, which presumably you could also prove this for, but we just picked one of them which uh, and, and proved it for that one. Uh, but you can find other counter examples. Uh, we don't claim in any way that six holes is optimal. We tried to look a bit for counter examples with fewer holes, uh, but but didn't find any. My guess would be that with more work, you could probably find counter examples with fewer holes than six. Uh, but but um, I, I've not uh, tried since then. 
Uh, okay, so if we come to the proof of this, so most of my talk will, will really be about, about this proof. Uh, I will come back a little bit to the spherical triangles, but, but most of what I will talk about will be about this. Uh, mostly because I think there are more interesting details here somewhere. Uh, so, I mean, I talked about numerics and computing rigorous bounds, and this is what we will use in the proof. So the question is, how can we reduce this theorem, proving this theorem, to something that we can check on the computer? Well, excuse me for interrupting again. Hmm? So from your picture just over here, you have a, a, a line that separates the you know, the, the function with the boundary, which is hexagonal. Um, yes. Is it possible then to make holes within this thing, you know, kind of like a fractal uh, way? And um, what would it look like? I mean, I, I mean, just, just it occurs to my mind that there's something fractal in here. Um, I, you mean, if you would cut holes somehow in right. here right i mean you start with a hexagon you cut some holes right so now you have another hexagon you can also cut holes and you can keep doing that right uh i i don't know exactly but i i don't think you would at least if you cut holes here you yeah. would get the second eigenfunction probably looks completely different uh, ah. well, so well you would... sure. i mean the domain is different yes, I mean, it's exactly. smaller it's small, uh, but, but it's the same uh, computation, isn't it? Um, what do you mean that? Uh, I mean, I mean, your your calculation here with the epsilon depends on the size of the hexagon, of course. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, but uh, that's the whole point. I mean, for the fractal. Uh, uh, but I don't know the, what uh, implication it means, but uh, yes, uh, it sounds like an interesting question to look at. Yes, yes. I don't know exactly what would happen. It's a good question. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so uh, the question is, how can we reduce this theorem to something that we can check on the computer? Uh, so the first step is that we use Courant's node aligned theorem, which is sort of a standard theorem in this field. And it tells us that there's at most two nodal domains for the second eigenfunction. So there's, uh, and in fact, it tells us that there's exactly two. Uh, uh, so there will be one part, uh, one subset of the domain where uh, the eigenfunction is negative or positive here, and one part where it's negative. And this will be a separate domain into two parts, uh, which will, and these two parts will be connected. Is, okay. is the Quran is the uh, theorem for dimension two or what? Uh, I think this works in... Uh, I, I think it works in two dimensions on, on manifolds as well. So, so it's, uh, it works for eigenfunctions in two dimensions. Right, but, but what in higher dimension is still just two nodal domain or is that changed? Uh, no, I think it's still two nodal domains in higher dimensions. So I have not looked at this case, uh, but I think it's still two for the, right. so the, the second one will still have two nodal domains. I, I'm fairly certain. Okay. Uh, so, what we can do is that we have two nodal domains and we have this gamma here, which is the red line. If we can prove that one of the nodal domains is fully contained inside of this gamma, that would mean that everything outside of gamma belongs to the other nodal domain, which means that since it belongs to one nodal domain, all of it, all of it must have the same sign. And that means that there can be no zeros outside of this gamma. And in particular, it means there are no zeros next to the boundary, which means the nodal line can't reach the boundary. Uh, so if we can prove that one nodal domain is contained inside of gamma, that would also mean that the nodal line is contained inside of gamma, since this is the boundary between the two domains. And OK, how can we prove that one nodal domain is contained inside of gamma? Well, it's enough to prove that u2 is negative on gamma. So if we can prove that it has a constant sign along gamma and positive somewhere inside. That it means that part of the positive uh, nodal domain is inside. And since it can't escape out, because then it must be positive somewhere on gamma, all of it must be inside. So we need to prove that user is negative on gamma and positive somewhere inside. And this we can, in fact, do with, with the tools I have already described. 
So assume we can compute some numerical approximation, u2 tilde, uh, and we can compute L infinity bounds for this. Uh, so we have some constant c, which uh, satisfies this. Then is if we can prove that u2 tilde, our approximation, is smaller than minus c on gamma, well, from this L infinity bound, it would follow that u2 is smaller than 0. So in particular, it's, it's negative. And if we can similarly prove that u2 tilde is greater than c for some x inside of gamma, then u2 must be greater than 0 somewhere inside of gamma. So that would, uh, from this, we would be able to conclude that the nodal line is contained fully inside of gamma. So we have reduced proving the theorem to only checking these two inequalities. And this is something we can do on the computer. So most of the remaining talk will be about the construction and this verification of the counterexample. Uh, and let me first uh, sort of the, the basic steps that we will follow. So the first step is to find a good numeric approximation, uh, u2 tilde and lambda 2 tilde of this eigenfunction eigenvalue. Uh, For this, we will use the, the NPS. The second part is to compute the rigorous bounds uh, for the approximation. And for this, we will use the, the theorem that I, that I showed earlier. And then a third part is that we need to certify that we have the correct index so that our approximation is actually an approximation for u2 and not for, say, u1 or u3 or u10, uh, because the theorem doesn't actually tell us anything about the, about the index. Uh, I will come back to this towards the end. Uh, it's a very important part of the proof, but uh, uh, I want to discuss the other two parts first. Uh, yes. So uh, again, the construction uses the method of particular solution. Uh, and now I want to say a little bit more about, about this, how we construct these things. Uh, so the construction is a linear combination of basis functions, where the basis functions should satisfy the differential equation exactly. And the choice of these basis functions is extremely important to get good convergence. And we combine, so in the way we do this, we combine ideas from, from several different papers. And I can maybe describe a bit more in, in uh, more detail what we do. Uh, we have three different types of basis functions in our linear combination. Uh, uh, the first type is this corresponds to these red dots here. So they are placed at the vertices on the outside of the, uh, on the domain. And the basis function here is given by this cell function times this sign term. And this is the basis used in the original MPS uh, paper. Uh, and they sort of, they give a good approximation of how the eigenfunction is supposed to behave next to these vertices. Around the vertices uh, at the holes, we use another type of basis function called the lightning charges. Uh, which was introduced by, by uh, uh, Threven in a quite recent paper from 2019, uh, uh, which we use at, at these vertices. And then finally, we have one interior expansion, just at the midpoint in this case, uh, which sort of handles the, uh, the other expansions handles the, gives the correct behavior at the vertices, and this interior expansion is sort of smoothing things out in the rest of the domain. Uh, so we combine these three to give us our approximation. Uh, and th the result is that we get some approximate eigenvalue. Uh, and then we, in this linear combination, we have a number of coefficients that we need to determine. Uh, and in this case, we have a lot of symmetries. So if you take the symmetries into account, we in the end have 476 uh, free uh, coefficients that we need to determine. And what we want to do is we want to make it approximate zero on the boundary. Uh, and the way we do this is that we pick a number of boundary points and then try to make it close to zero on these boundary points. And in this case, we have this many boundary points. Uh, yes. uh, so that was how we constructed the approximation. Um, and then we have this theorem again by Muller and Payne. Uh, this is the same theorem before, but now I also added this. And we have this upper bound for this uh, g of x when we work in the plane, uh, which we do in this case. Uh, so this is sort of not a problem. The only thing we need to handle is this mu, which we need to give an upper bound of, and this alpha, which we need to give a lower bound of. And for this alpha, we need to understand the, 
uh, eigenvalues which are close. So we need to understand lambda one and lambda three to know how far away from these we are. Uh, and I will get back to this towards the end if I have time. Uh, but for now, let's just assume we, we have some lower bound for alpha, which we uh, will come back to later. But assume we have some lower bound for alpha. Then what remains is to give an upper bound for mu. Uh, and well, mu consists of three parts, the square root of the area of the domain, which is easy to handle. And then it's the supremum on the boundary. Uh, and then it's the norm. And for the supremum on the boundary, uh, we make use of integral arithmetic, and we combine this with Taylor arithmetic. And in this case, we need to use Taylor expansions of extremely high degree, or a very high degree, because there's a lot of cancellations in the in the expansion we have. I mean, in some sense, we pick the, the uh, expansion so that we get a lot of uh, cancellations on the boundary. Uh, so we use Taylor expansions of a degree around 100 to be able to treat this in a, in a good way. Uh, in the end, we get some sort of upper bound for the maximum on the boundary. Uh, we need to compute a lower bound for the norm as well. Uh, we do this by computing the norm on, of only a, a subset of the domain to have, avoid having to deal with all the more complicated geometry of the full domain. Uh, but I don't think I will go into detail with, with uh, how this works uh, now, because there's not too much time. Excuse me, is the picture of the graph of this uh, problem function. It looks like the graph of uh, beats. Um, uh, is there any way that you could find the exact the formula for the function? Uh, I mean, so this function or, we do, Yeah. I mean, we have the exact formula for this function in some sense. I mean, we, we have a linear combination of functions we know and the coefficients we know, they are some numerically determined values. Uh, but I don't think we can, I mean, we, we use this in some sense when we compute the Taylor uh, uh, series, uh, the, the Taylor approximations, but I don't think we can, I don't think we can be much smarter than that, uh, at least not that I know. I mean, it, it really looks like uh, the, the graphs of, uh, of beats, um, you know, so, so it seems that there should be some, um, Maybe some symbolic method to to actually find the function. Uh, I mean, so uh, this will be a sum of Bessel functions, and Bessel yeah. functions, I mean, have this oscillating behavior. Uh, right. So, uh, I mean, we, in some we we do have the exact uh, the expression for this function, but okay. uh, we still need to bound the maximum somehow. But uh, I mean, to some extent, you can. I mean, I guess the Taylor approximations we use are, I mean, in some sense, a symbolic uh, thing in that we actually know the exact function we're working with. Okay. Uh, but it's possible that you could also use uh, the other methods for, for handling this. That is, uh, that is true. So what I'm asking really is the, the red curve that you have, um, is that numerically computed or, or what? Uh, so, I mean, in this plot, uh, the red curve is, uh, I've sort of uh, just evaluated the function at a number of points, and then we get the red curve. Of course, this is still an approximation because it's a plot. Uh, and the blue things is the enclosures we compute right, when we right. try to those, bound. Those are the interval bounds, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Uh, I think actually this picture is from the spherical triangles case, uh, uh, but uh, the idea is the same in the plane as well. Uh, okay, so with these uh, methods, then we can actually prove this theorem. So if we have this approximation and we compute this uh, bound from u, we have this lower bound from alpha, which we assume, uh, then we get this L infinity bound for u to tilde. So we get that the error is at, at most this large. And then we can prove that u to tilde is smaller than or equal to this number on gamma. And since this is larger in absolute value than the L infinity bound, we get that U2 is also negative on gamma. Uh, similarly, we can evaluate U2 uh, tilde at a point inside, we get this enclosure. And since well, th this value is uh, much larger than 
than the other ones we have, we get that uh, U2 is also positive on a point inside. And this was everything we needed to prove the theorem. We needed to prove that it's uh, negative on gamma and positive somewhere inside. So from this, the theorem follows. Uh, what I've not explained yet, of course, is to how do we know that our U2 tilde actually corresponds to U2, and how do we get this lower bound for alpha? Um, yes. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the spherical triangles, uh, but I'm realizing that uh, it's all, already 40 minutes. Um, Do you want me to, I, I can talk a bit about this and maybe skip the end part. Uh, I'm not sure how. how uh, yeah, how, how much, uh, how do you estimate the, the, the time about for spherical triangles? Uh, for the spherical triangles, it will be two to four minutes, let's say. Okay, well, I, I guess we have five minutes for sure. Uh, so uh, I, I guess I will be brief in the interest of time, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the results for the spherical triangles. Uh, so in this case, we have a spherical. So we, we wanted to compute these eigenvalues for, for a, a number of spherical triangles. Uh, and in this case, it's a spherical triangle with these angles. Uh, and my goal will be to sort of explain what these plots mean. And they also tell you a bit more about how this MPS method actually work. So if we begin with the plot to the left here, uh, we have our eigenvalue. It's the x-axis. And the y-axis here is. Uh, uh, what I have to explain what it is. So remember that the MPS works by, we look at a linear combination of our basis functions, and we try to make it small on the power. Uh, but the linear combination depends on lambda. So if we fix some lambda, then we can uh, try to pick the coefficients to make it small on the boundary. This is done using some, some linear algebra to minimize the L2 norm on, on, of our points we picked on the boundary. And this sigma of lambda is basically how small we can get it on the boundary by picking the coefficients in this way. So depending on the value of lambda, we might be able to make it small on the boundary, or we might not be able to make it small on the boundary. Uh, and sort of in general, we cannot make it very small on the boundary. But what happens is that for some values of lambda, we can make this linear combination very small on the boundary. And these minimas corresponds to the eigenvalues. So if lambda is close to an eigenvalue, then we can pick this uh, li uh, this linear combination to make it small in the boundary. Otherwise, it's impossible. Uh, so what you do in the method is that you try different values of lambda, uh, and then try to pick the lambda which minimizes this sigma of lambda. So you get some sort of minimization problem. Uh, and then what you do is that, well, OK, you try to find the minima. Uh, and the plot here to the right is we have different numbers of coefficients. So I mean, we have a, 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 an expansion, and we can pick the number of terms we have in this in this linear combination. Uh, and what we plot here is the, the blue line is the approximate error. So it's sort of we have uh, on the side computer a, a sort of quite accurate uh, uh, value for this. And then we compare this approximation to this more accurate value we have. And we can see how how this converges. So how, how fast does this minima converge towards the true value? Uh, and we can see that as n increases, we get very good convergence. The, the error goes down uh, quite quickly. Uh, and using the theorem, we can compute these rigorous error bounds. And uh, this is this orange, orange curve here. And we see that also the rigorous error bounds go down very quickly. Uh, you see that they, they start to diverge a little bit here. But, but you still have very good convergence in the orange line. So by increasing n, we can get very small errors. And this is, I mean, already here, we are uh, below machine precision in this case. Uh, but, but we use high precision computations. Uh, and so, I mean, the goal with computing these eigenvalues was to relate it to the random walks. Uh, so we focused a bit extra on one specific random walk, which is called the Krebras walk. Uh, which is interesting for, uh, I mean, there's been several papers re related to this walk. Uh, uh, and the, the parameters uh, that I mentioned in the beginning, this k rho to the n, uh, n to the alpha, in two dimensions, alpha is known to be rational for this walk. 
uh, but in three dimensions, it's not known if alpha is rational or not. So we wanted to try to compute approximations of alpha to see, does it look like it's rational or if it's irrational? We can't prove anything about it, but we can see what if it seems plausible or not. Uh, and this corresponds, uh, so this walk corresponds to a spherical triangle with uh, angles 2 pi over 3. Uh, and there's a lot of symmetry for these reasons, which means we can compute even more uh, uh, digits by using this symmetry. Uh, and we compute this approximation, or I mean, so we, com we compute lambda, and we get that it's given by this, where all of the digits shown here are, are correct. So the, the error bound in our approximation is, is smaller than the unit in last place. So we can compute quite a lot of digits. Uh, from this, we can compute the corresponding alpha. We get this value, again, with a lot of digits. Now the question is, is this alpha rational or not? Uh, of course, we can't prove it just from this finite information, but we can get some indication. So what we can do is we can compute the continued fraction, uh, which is given by this here. And again, all of these numbers that are shown here are, are the true numbers. Uh, but we, due to the errors we have, we, we can't come further than this. Uh, and from this continued fraction, you can compute that, okay, if alpha was rational, then the denominator would be at least this large, which is a fairly big number. Uh, and compared to the 2D case, where I think it's like 2 over 3 or something like that. I, I don't remember exactly, but it's, like, it's, it, it's bounded by 10 for sure. It, it very much looks like it's irrational in this case. We don't have a proof, but at least if you wanted to prove something, you should probably try to prove that it's rational. Uh, uh, so this was the, the sort of end result of this paper. Uh, and then I don't have much time, or I don't have any time. So we'll just skip all of these uh, discussions about index. Uh, if you have questions about it, I can, I can see if I can ask something. Uh, I was just wanted to say, uh, since it was discussed at the beginning, but uh, the code for, for both of these papers are written in Julia, and it uses ARB for the computations uh, through the Nemo and the ARB lib, uh, library. Uh, and if you're interested, you can find the code for both papers on my GitHub. Uh, the, the first one actually has a bit of a nicer presentation. Uh, the, the, the one for the circle triangles is a bit more messy. So I, if, you, if you should look at something, it's probably this one. Uh, and uh, with that, I guess, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. So yeah, please questions, you can type them in, into chat or just unmute yourself and, and ask. Uh, <clears throat> I have a question. Uh, uh, a few slides ago, you showed um, how uh, your approximate solution was away from uh, the actual solution by a little bit, right? So you had an upper bound. Uh, yes, I mean this maybe. Yeah. And um, so this is uh, for a particular PD with a particular boundary, right? Yes. Um, how so what happens uh, um, with this if you change the pd a little bit and if you change the boundary so how is it how is it generalizable um, so if you change the pd i don't think you can say too much so as a sort of uh, and a problematic part let's say with the mps uh, so if you go back here is that you need the approximation to exactly satisfy the differential equation, which means that you need these eigenfunctions to exactly satisfy the differential equation, or these basis functions. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you perturb the, base, the, uh, the equation, this will no longer hold true, and I think most of the theory would fall down. I, I think there's some work on, uh, I mean, I've seen some work on okay, how, how well behaved is this if you perturb the equation, uh, but, but I don't know exactly. Uh, if you perturb the, the domain, is uh, then I can at least partially answer. So if you perturb the domain, I mean, what would happen is that this, uh, these boundaries would change, which would mean that the uh, approximation is no longer as small on the boundary as it was before. But if you only perturb your domain a little bit, then if the approximation was very, uh, very close to zero on the boundary, then it should still be quite close to zero if you perturb the domain. 
unless the, the derivative is very high, close to the boundary. So there you could easily get some sort of um, bound on how much this would change, uh, because it will still be approximately zero, even though it would be less approximately zero if you put that domain. Uh, does this answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, but, that, but I think the, the whole problem here or, or aim is to find a counter example to, yes. to a conjecture. So there's no need to generalize counter examples that much, right? No, in this case, we don't need it. That is true. Uh, so in this case, we just need to find some domain for which it works. Uh, but this could be interesting if you're looking for a family of domains, for example, which satisfies something. Then maybe you can prove it for, say, say you have, a, a, I don't know, a one dimensional family of domains. And then you can do this for a number of points in this one dimensional family. And then you could uh, extend the bounds you get by looking at, at this continuity in terms of, the, of how the domain changes. Right. Yeah, so for other problems, it could be re relevant. But, but in this case, it's not needed. Other questions? So I have a couple of questions. So one is kind of follow up on what you were saying to Alexei. So you said that if you perturb uh, PD, then um, many things break down. But the like the, the whole idea of MPS, as you described, like sounds to work for any linear linear PD, right? So for any linear PD, if you have like eigenfunctions, you can try to sum them up to yes. uh, cancel on the boundary. Like what's yes. what's so special about Laplacian in this case? So the, the, the important thing is that we need to know some functions which solve the equation, but not the boundary conditions. And for the Laplacian, we know this. It's the Bessel functions with the sine of cosine. And for some other specific kinds of equation, you can do this as well. So for example, right. if you just look at the Laplace equation without the eigenfunctions, we also know what they look like. Uh, and, and there's certain other specific types of equations where we have these basic functions and we know them. Uh, but if you have some sort of arbitrary equation, then even finding something which satisfies the, the, the PDE, but not the boundary equations could be hard. Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, but, but I mean, there is stability in the PDE as well. So I, I think there are some work, but I haven't used it. So I haven't read up too much on it. Uh, there are some theorems which tells you what happens if you have approximation in both of these. Mm. So if you have an approximate equal, uh, if this only holds approximately and this only holds approximately, you can still get some sort of bounds, but they will be worse. And I think they are also more complicated to, co to compute. Uh, I haven't used them, so I, I don't know the details. Uh -huh. in, the, in the basic functions here, uh, yep. with different k's, how do you make sure that the lambda tutor doesn't depend on k? Um, so, uh, uh, what you do is you fix one lambda. Uh, so in, in I, I can show maybe in our case, it's the simplest. Um, but you don't know lambda, right? I mean, you don't know lambda tutor. You don't know uh, what, what you do is you have these basis functions and they will basically take lambda as a parameter. Ah. Uh, so in our case, we have these basis functions where square root of lambda comes in. So we can, for any oh, choice of lambda, see, we see, can. So, so in the example, you can do that, you're saying? Yes. And okay. I think in all cases where you can find these, but you I mean, a gen some. as a general method, uh, you don't know that uh, that that the uh, basic function phi of k. I mean, the eigenvalues don't depend on k. But uh, in a, in a specific domain and s s specific function that you use to construct this example, of course, then you can you yeah. you in fact know lambda, right? Yes. 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 But in general, and, uh, not, right? No. So the and, question and that's is sort of... why, in general, how this MK, MPS method. Um, oh, I see. So, so in the MPS method, you actually, so it, it's only used for counter examples. The MPS. Uh, I mean, so it's used for when you want to compute solutions to the Laplace equations numerically. Right, but then in that case, how do you guarantee the, that the, the lambda tutor in that equation doesn't depend on k? Uh, so maybe what I should have done here is that usually your choice of basic function have a parameter lambda, 
uh, or take lambda, sorry, uh, which take lambda to parameter. So in, in some right. sense, I mean, the lambda here is a parameter for this basis so, function. And the same is true for these. Uh, so uh, what maybe would have been a, a, a better here is to call this phi k comma lambda tilde. Because the basis functions right. take a k, but but they also okay. take the eigenvalue. All right. Okay. All right. And okay. and you some are, some are you need them. Otherwise, you can't yeah. use this method. Right. Okay. Thanks. I have also a question about this the the curvature walk. So uh, you 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 got this very precise number, right? And and you see that it's likely not not a rational one. But I, I I thought there are also algorithms which kind of try can try to guess you algebraic numbers and some other stuff. Like I guess if you take uh, such a thing and even put it into Wolfram Alpha, Wolfram Alpha will will try, will try to suggest you something. Did you try uh, this? Um, I, we didn't try it for the paper, but I tried it later on a bit. So uh, I guess it's. Uh, Frederick, who develops ARB, also has this calcium package, which mm -hmm. is quite new, uh, somewhat new, I guess. And it's, this has some functionality for trying to find algebraic equations for satisfying this. Uh, and I tried to plug it in this, and it didn't give me anything, up to order, say, 50 or something. Uh, but uh, at least his method doesn't give any guarantees. It only tries it best. So most likely, there it does not satisfy any algebraic equation with order below, say, 50. Uh, but I don't think his method gives a proof of it, so so I, I, I wouldn't guarantee it. But, uh, but you see, once you put it in continual fraction, you have a sequence, right? Yes. OK, and then the, there is a, the, a, a library of uh, number sequences. So have you checked that, whether this is something recognizable? Uh, yes, I think I have put it into several of these libraries, and I, I didn't find anything. Uh, oh, OK. Um, uh -huh. well, of course, this is a very particular example. So yes. uh, that you choose this lambda to be this 5.159 or whatever. Um, yeah. Have you tried some lambda that is uh, Exact that you, since you since you say lambda is just a parameter that you use in finding the basic functions, you can kind of choose lambda to be anything you want, isn't it? Uh, what you would do in that case is you would. I mean, you're you're finding a concrete example, so the lambda tilde depends on the lambda, right? No, I I think this is the second result. This result with the random walks. Yes, where this is related to the random walks. Oh, okay, but but still, that's that's just an example, right? I mean, it's just an example in three dimensions instead of two. Yes. Uh, so so uh, there are some spherical triangles for which you can compute it exactly, uh, when you can get the exact value for lambda. Oh, oh, I see. So you so this lambda depends on the random walk. You're saying yes, yes. Do you do you know how it depends on it? Uh, yes. So from uh, from the random walk, which depends on a sort of set of steps you can take. Right. From this, you can compute the triangle. Uh, it's a bit involved. It, I mean, you can do it, uh, but it's it's not it's not so super can, easy, can, but it's not that complicated either. Yeah, but can you do it reverse in in reverse order? In other words, specify the uh, spherical triangle with a lambda which is nice. Round number, uh, for example, yes, yes. and then construct the um, the random walk uh, steps, right? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think you can do that as well. Yes. Well, in in that case, then the alpha that you computed might be recognizable. See, uh, it is not recognizable when lambda is such a you know. <laughs> no, I mean, so you, yeah. what 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 happens is you you can get alpha to be any value, basically. I mean, if you pick a, you can pick a spherical triangle so that alpha becomes minus two or minus three. I mean, so ah, it will just okay. depend on the on the triangle, right? And since it's sort of continuous, you can get it to be any value. Okay. So, so why do you why do you um... why we look at so what I mean? Here. What kind of random walk are you interested in then? Uh, so this example is for a specific watch, which is called a Crevice walk, ah, and okay. uh, in that case, the the step set is that. Uh, maybe I can. Well, there are many ran random walk uh, rules that you can uh, use. Yes, yes. So uh, the steps that will be like this, 
and then okay, I, I, this was harder to draw than I expected. Sorry. Minus one, minus one here, here, or here, and then the final type of step you can take will be yes, once everywhere. Yeah, is um, is my thing around? Because I think he with these random walks with these steps there, I believe it's related to um, some different equations. I mean, yeah. Um. I mean the you know the random walks. Um, I think he he gives a talk. I mean I don't remember exactly the precise things, but um, you know he he actually classifies I believe all the random walks um, in terms of different equations and things like that. Uh, so I mean it, it, I mean the 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 sequence. So you you have a difference equation and the solution is uh, uh, interpolation of uh, different uh, different sequences. Yeah, that could uh, very well be the case. I, I haven't worked so much on this random walk specifically. I mostly worked on the ones you reduce it to these eigenvalues. So I don't know so much of the details for the random walk. Ah, okay. Maybe you could uh, ask uh, Mike Singer if he's not here today. Uh, but I know that this alpha, I think if this alpha is rational, then the sequence satisfies a, 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 a differential equation. Okay. Uh, a difference equation with uh, some integer polynomials, I think. Uh, uh -huh. If it's not rational, then this is not the case. If I, uh, yeah. the case, I think. But I, I'm not an expert on that side, so I, I shouldn't say too much, I think. All right, any, any other questions? Oh, yes, if you have a bit of time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, if you have a bit of questions. <laughs> Uh, so my question was with your with your basis. So if we look at the error plot, it seems that you have an exponential convergence of the coefficients, or the error term at least. You mean from this? Yeah, I think he, it's yeah, it looks like you have an exponential. Like it looks like a straight line in a log plot. So exponential. Yes, I think it's root exponential. Uh, if I. Oh. Uh, like exponential of square root of n or something yes. like this. Yes. So, okay, and so n is your total number of um, elements oh. in, the, in the basis. Yes. And so first, is it like what you propose as a basis? Is it like a true basis? Like it's like linearly independent and it, it spans all the space, the L2 space? Yes. Uh, and for that, you don't need, so you, you can pick, it's, it's quite easy to pick basis functions so that it's linearly independent and they span all space. So you will get, in some sense, convergence in a lot of cases. Uh, but to get good convergence, you need to pick correctly somehow. Yeah, because otherwise you would expect just a finite order convergence or something one over n or something bad. And here you have something really good, and it's like it's almost surprising as it, like you can find like with such a somehow complicated domain. Uh... Uh, this one is for the spherical triangle, I should maybe say, so that that there we get that it doesn't the picture oh, is not yeah. quite as nice for our more complicated domain. Uh, Oh okay. yeah, that's true. That's for the yeah the, for the triangles. I get confused with the. Uh, but what was the basis you used for the the hexagonal domains with the triangles? Uh, this was the uh, this basis. So the. Uh, oh yes, yes. yes this is, uh, uh, so yeah, and this one is also a basis. Yes. yes. Okay. So there is no redundance. There is no. Ah. Okay. Uh, uh, I think actually each one of these by themselves. I, I mean. Just having this gives you a basis. Okay, so you they are need all basis. So together, uh, it's like it's like you you glue like you just uh, do the direct sum of different bases. So it's like no longer a basis. Yes. It's like there's linear dependence, yes. but it it it's like it's like having an over determined thing just to, to find because if you just choose one basis, then you don't have an exponential. You have only one. Um, you have only one development in this basis, but then it's not exponentially convergent, right? It because it only, on tackles, it, it only tackles, for example, the red singularities and not the yes. blue and the exactly. green ones. Exactly. But if you combine them, then you no longer have a basis. 
but um, but you kind of uh, so how do you solve like a, with a least square problem or something like this? Uh, so what you do this is what they discuss a lot in in this uh, paper reviving the method of particular solution oh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in this paper. Uh, so what they do is that you you take some boundary points where you try to minimize it, but you also okay. take some interior points, and then you try to keep the norm. Uh, to be around one on this interior it's not, Yeah, it's, it's, it's true. You need it's really some sort of normalization to get it to work. Because properly. among all the possibilities to, to write in, in this so over-determined basis somehow, you want one that is like, let's say, exponentially convergent. OK, so it's, it's really interesting to know that you can, uh, you can do it just, yeah. I think, so in, in the methods we use, we get, I think it's root exponential convergence, at least in theory. Yeah, uh, but mean, they have some follow-up papers. Uh, which they call the log lightning method. And there they claim that they can get exponential convergence by using yeah, a slightly different set of basic functions, uh, which I haven't tried myself yet. I think I will, I have some new projects to come up where I will probably try this method as well. Uh, and they, they give a lot of details on how they, they look at the convergence and sort of- uh, Yeah, I think it's- Something related to it and to a lot of numerics. Where they, they take the singularities of the domain and they kind of accum accumulate roots, uh, like yes. poles, sorry, poles of the rational function, like in kind of, yes, lines like going to the singularity. Okay, but you chose like not rational functions, but like somehow better uh, functions even maybe? No, the, the thing is that they pick rational functions because they don't look at eigenvalues. Oh. Oh, they yes. look at the, this being equal to zero. So okay. then the rational functions are solutions. But in our case, we need to work with the Bessel functions, which are more complicated. Okay. So it's just because they consider a different uh, PD. And so, sorry, just very last question. Uh, then, so considering this, what is the part of the, the computational, uh, I don't mean the computer system proof that takes the, the longest time? Is it like this uh, computing the basis? Or it's like uh, bonding, bonding the error afterwards of the boundary? Or? They take about the same time. Uh, oh. So computing approximation takes about six hours, and bounding it takes about six hours. Uh, so, so they are roughly the same in this case. And in the rigorous part, so it's like it's it's in the rigorous parts. Yes, the computation of rigorous bounds. Like the the most costly part is it like bonding the function uh, on the, uh, the 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 contour or the the border. Uh, yes, yes. Because you have to uh, subdivide, the... subdivide, subdivide, and Taylor models for each one. Yes, exactly. And uh, somehow, I mean, our uh, the, the approximation is constructed to take a lot of functions, which are not small and choose the coefficients so that it becomes small on the boundary. So there's huge cancellations. Uh, so yes, okay. that's so, why yeah, it's maybe very... That's the, yeah, maybe that's the defect of this non-independent uh, basis. Because in an independent basis, no, but... it's, usually, it's usually the case that the coefficient itself should be small, or maybe here there is some effect of this combining different bases. I don't know. Uh, but somehow, I mean, the goal is to pick the coefficients so that they can slot, because we want it to be small. Yes, yes, yes. You want them to be small, but still so you have a lot of cancellation. That's why this takes a lot of uh, time mm, to do. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, great. Then uh, thank, th thank you, Joe, for answering all these uh, numerous questions. And now uh, we can um, continue with our traditional informal part in the breakout rooms.